More than 13 years after 9-11, the proponents of radical Islam possess more territory, have more adherents in more places, and control more money than ever. Why aren't the good guys winning? With us today, one man who believes he knows the answer and knows what to do about it. Jim Hake, founder of Spirit of America on Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. After graduating from Dartmouth College in 1979 and the Stanford Business School in 1983, Jim Hake became a venture capitalist in Los Angeles and did very well for himself. Then in 2003, he founded Spirit of America, a nonprofit intended to help American troops do their work, in a word, to help them win. Joining me with Jim Hake is General Jim Mattis, United States Marine Corps, recently retired, now a fellow at the Hoover Institution. General Mattis was one of Spirit of America's earliest supporters. Jim Hake and Jim Mattis, welcome. Thank you, Thank Peter. You. Jim Hake, tell us what happened when you were watching the National Geographic Channel on television one day in 2003. Well, Peter, it, I'll back up a little bit before that. Really, the attacks of 9-11 were what had me interested in somehow supporting the U.S. mission abroad. I had two children, I have two children, they were seven and four at the time, and I wanted to make sure they grew up with the same freedoms and opportunities that I had had. Uh, my father had served in World War II, he was a CB in the Navy, and he and his generation did their part. So after 9-11, I was very committed to doing my part. So it took a while to figure out what would actually be useful to do. Um, you know, I'd learned enough in business to be able to distinguish between what sounds good and what is good. And the light bulb moment was when I was watching the National Geographic show that you mentioned. And it talked about the special forces team in Afghanistan. And one fellow in particular, Sergeant First Class Jay Smith. And their job was to hunt down Al Qaeda. But to do that, they needed the support of the local population, a village uh, named Orgoon where they were serving right on the Pakistan border. And so the show talked about how he and his men had built relationships with the local villagers. And they had done a lot of it with the help from folks back home. So literally, Jay would get on his satellite phone at the time, call his wife, Diane, and say, hey, honey, can you send over, it was blankets or sandals or shoes, sports equipment, even baseball equipment. And so that was the, the light bulb moment. And it, it occurred to me that guys and gals like Jay literally were the front lines of our country. Wherever they served, those were the front lines. They were the guys on the ground. And in many ways, they were more of our true ambassadors than the official ambassadors. Mm -hmm. They had more impact on the perceptions of America and Americans than anyone. And of course, the whole mission really rested on their shoulders. If they didn't succeed, the mission didn't succeed. So I realized, I thought that there must be other men like Jay who needed some help that they couldn't get from government channels and that instead of calling their home, their families, they could uh, reach out to me and I would use the internet to get people to help. So that was the idea of Spirit of America. Jim, you have said that both in business and Spirit of America, and I'm quoting you, you have to get to the point where the transaction really happens. What do you mean by that? Well, you have to get where the action is. So in business, if you're not talking to a customer, your idea it won't fly. You have to know exactly what people are doing, whether they're gonna react to positively to what you're doing or not. So in my case, after I had this you know, idea watching the National Geographic show, I flew to Fort Bragg, uh, met with Jay Smith and his team and laid out the idea. I basically said, okay, you need something. You can't get it uh, through government channels. It's important to your mission. Instead of calling your families, you, you reach out to me. And they were, so that was my market test, if you will. Right. And they were just about jumping out of their seats at this idea. And um, he, Jay kept saying, this is going to save lives. And at first I thought he was just being enthusiastic. And so the third time he said it, I asked him to explain why. And what he said was that because of the relationship that he and his team had built with the Afghan villagers, they, the, the villagers formed the night watch patrol to protect our guys from Al Qaeda that had been crossing the Pakistan border at night and firing rockets on their camp. And that, no one asked the villagers to do it. No one paid them to do it. And so that made this whole idea of uh, hearts and minds, let's say, as practical as you could possibly get. And at that point, I, I knew I wouldn't forgive myself if I didn't give the idea a shot. So early on, you meet Jim Mattis, 
And as I understand it, Jim, you're, this is in 2003, you're at Pendleton, you're about to deploy to Iraq for the first... Second time. Second time, second time. You listened to him explain Spirit of America, and then you said you could use medical equipment, school supplies, and Frisbees. Frisbees? Yeah. You want to explain that, please, General? Peter, here, here's the bottom line. America's got two fundamental powers. One is the power of inspiration. One is the power of intimidation. Obviously, those of us who wear the uniform are in an intimidating role up against the enemy. But we now fight wars among innocent people, among populations that need to be on our side if we're going to win. There is where the America's power of inspiration comes to bear. And that's why you want to reach out across the cultural divides that always exist, that should exist in a world with, with diversity, and make common cause with people. This was going to give us from an NGO, a non-governmental organization, that was unapologetically non-neutral. They were on our side. And at that point, uh, like with the special forces, we almost had to pinch ourselves. It, we had somebody uh, with this concept that could bring it to bear. Jim, let me add, this will seem impolite, but if I have the question in the back of my mind, a lot of people will. The Pentagon budget is hundreds of billions of dollars. Why can't you get the Pentagon to toss some Frisbees into your equipment if you, if you need it? You said you spoke to the uh, sergeant. Uh, sergeant first class. That's right, and he's calling his wife, Diane. How, why can't we afford blankets and Frisbees? Why do you need an outside NGO, non-governmental organization? Actually, so either one of you answer that one. You both know the answer better than I do. What's, wh how come? Well, I'm going to reference my roots in Silicon Valley. And you look at uh, our economy, the most dynamic and innovative economy in the world. And you have commercial banks and you have venture capital firms. They're both just dealing with money. Right. However, the, the, the commercial bank has different rules and regulations, different expectations uh, from its depositors. And the venture capital firm has a different set of uh, criteria for what it spends money on. And, but it's all just money. So you'll never get the kind of speed and flexibility from the largest institution. The DOD is a three million person organization right. that's optimized to operate on a global scale and do all the things that it has to do in terms of conventional operations. You'll never get that in an organization like that to be able to be good at uh, flexibility and small scale innovation at the lowest levels. It, it doesn't happen in Silicon Valley. It's why Google acquires companies and, and funds entrepreneurs. It, it's Even why Microsoft Google can't does the do same. It. Right. Even no, no one can do it. There's a place for small. Right. Got and it. so the, the, the real question, I think, Peter, and any large organization, anyone who's worked in any business or, or government, you know, we're aware of the limitations. You know, in, in the case of government, you have limitations on taxpayer money that as taxpayers, we insist on. We really do. Right. So the, 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 the real trick is uh, not asking the question, why can't government do it, which is it's fair to insist on better performance for sure. But the real question is, how do we win? How do we prevail? How do the values and ideas and ideals that we stand for as a country persist and prevail in the world? And when you look at that, you say, well, we shouldn't leave that up to government alone. And these are situations, the security challenges we face, where you've, you've got to have the best that America can bring. And that's both its government and military, for sure. We have the best service people in the world. But it's also what the American people and private sector can bring to it. And that when you look at that, that's when you really get the inspiration that the general talked about. Give me another couple of examples. There's one example. Tell me why Spirit of America cares about goats in West Africa. Well, we have been supporting uh, mainly special operations teams in West Africa for the last few years. And it's a very uh, dynamic situation. You have a number of uh, Islamic extremist groups, uh, some of which are well known now, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb causing problems. And the problems they cause are, are important ones in terms of the stability of the region and ultimately to our own security and Europe's security. Mm -hmm. So one army captain in a, one West African nation uh, was tasked with getting out to a remote area where Al Qaeda had been causing problems. And his tasking, his mission was get out there, figure it out, and do something. Without, start, without firing weapons. This goes back to what you're finding out where the transaction actually takes place. Right. Is, got it. And, and, you, you, there, and it, you think about that and you say, well, he had to have you know, better guidance than that. And really, no one could tell him exactly what to do until he got out there and figured it out. What he came to understand was that the number one problem the local villagers uh, wanted to solve in that case was livestock health. 
Livestock health was the basis of the economy. It was their culture. It was their food source. It was everything. Livestock health was more important than human health, which would you know, surprise most of us. So uh, we engaged right at the time he was doing that, figuring it out, let's say. And so what we ended up doing was funding uh, local men to go into business as veterinarians so they could make money solving their village's biggest problem. Now, livestock health wasn't really the objective of the US team. Their objective was to get out there, improve stability in these areas, build relationships, and create the kind of resiliency in these communities that would push back against Al Qaeda. And it's worked beautifully. These guys are now, they don't need our help anymore, the, the, these veterinarians. They're making money, they're, they're heroes in their community, and they all did it because of the ingenuity of an army captain who understood the problem and who understood how to reach back and get some help in ways that, that government really wasn't optimized for. Right, right. And that's exactly, I can just see if this poor guy called the Pentagon and said, I need, I'm not quite sure what I need, but I think I need locals to go into, the Pentagon would have no clue how to, God bless all you men in uniform, but they just wouldn't have any idea what to, how to handle that problem, right? That's, that's, that's okay. You are famous for saying, Jim Mattis mentioned this a, a, a moment ago, I'm quoting you, Jim Hake, spirit of America is not neutral. We take sides. Explain that and tell me why it matters. So what we do goes back to my motivation after 9-11. And it was to help our nation prevent another 9-11 on a tactical basis, but also to see that the values that we stand for, the religious freedom, the rights of women and minorities, that those see it through into the future. Because those are really the foundation of our, the, those values are the foundation of our prosperity, of every opportunity that we enjoy. So that was my motivation. So I was very clear on what Spirit of America was about. We are not the freelance do-gooders. So, and the way that we do that is to support the U.S. mission, is to listen and respond to U.S. troops and diplomats trying to solve some tough problem and then looking at how can we bring in private assistance to help them do it. That's purely what we do. What I've learned in the last few years is that is rather groundbreaking in the international assistance world. The international assistance world is defined in many ways by universal humanitarian principles. So most international assistance organizations, most famously the, the Red Cross, which is a critically important organization, right. by the right. way, are required to be neutral, which means that they cannot take a side in any conflict or controversy. Right. They are required to be independent, which means they provide assistance independent of US political, economic, or military objectives. So we are not neutral. We take the side of our troops and diplomats, and the only thing we do is to support their missions. Spirit of America wishes the armed forces of the United States to prevail and our enemies to fail. That's exactly right. Got it. Got it. Jim Mattis, tell me, how, reassure me that he's not just talking a good game here. No, he's not, you, Peter. You, you, we, you, you met him in 2000, this is a dozen years ago now. Right. Let me give you an example. In Al Anbar province, you know it as the Sunni Triangle, right. uh, currently occupied by ISIS, I might add. We had Sunni tribes out there that really felt pressured from what was going on politically in the country to ally itself with Al Qaeda. There came a point where we were able to convince them that they'd gotten in bed with the wrong people and they started to come over to our side. Uh, we wanted some significant way of characterizing that shift, that fundamental shift that eventually would spell the end for the Al-Qaeda in those days. Uh, they obviously regenerated since. Uh, how did we make this significant enough to really uh, put an exclamation point on what was happening? It would have been inappropriate for us to go to the U.S. government and say, we want to buy Marine officer dress swords. Frankly, swords leave me cold. But to the people in Al Anbar province, the idea that the U.S. Marine Corps was going to hand them a sword worth hundreds of dollars as a symbol that we were now on the same side, it was a big deal to them. And again, you know, you can't use your cultural lens to make all your decisions. It will, it will doom you in these kind of wars. So we went to Jim Hake and asked him to purchase, I think it was about 10 of them before we got done as the different tribes came over, these swords that are worth hundreds of dollars. 
would have been inappropriate to use the taxpayer's money to take money out of the taxpayer's pocket and say we're going to go buy a dress sword with it. But that's exactly what Jim Hake with his venture capital allowed us to do. The venture worked and it made for a very strong alliance while we were there. Uh, and so I would just tell you there's many cases like this where it's just not right to use government money and we're taking risk with some of it. Some of it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, when have we ever asked for all of our solutions to come from the government? America's not built like that. How big are you now? How big is Spirit of America? There are nine of us. Nine? Yes. Operating uh, in how many places? We've mentioned Af West Africa, Afghanistan, everywhere American troops are located, or are you, you can't, with nine people, you can't quite handle that. How do you, how do you, how do you prioritize? So uh, Spirit of America has provided support in over 32 countries. Uh, we, right now we have our field personnel, and they're all military veterans. So our, our field team, who literally work side by side, U.S. troops on the ground. You, you these are your employees now? Yes. They're, this is right. their full time? Okay. Right. Okay. They're, they're, they're right. military veterans. They all served in Iraq or Afghanistan. So they have on the ground experience. They know what's involved and what, how things work. So our guys work alongside the U.S. military and civilian personnel. And these are, these are civil military teams in really every part of the world where we're operating to understand what they're trying to accomplish and how we can help. And because we are leveraging and building on top of their ingenuity, their effort, and what they know needs to be done and can't do through government channels, it's highly leveraged. So we're able to cover down on uh, projects in, you know, right now I think we're operating in 15 countries. Uh, the Middle East is something that's popped up you know, in a, a major way recently. Uh, two of our guys right now are in Lebanon. Uh, they were in Kurdistan or Iraq uh, the day before that, and the week before that they were in Jordan. So we're able to identify what the gaps are in government funding and to be able to fill those very quickly. It's, it's really a great marriage because you have all the things that the government can do. And then you bring to it the, the entrepreneurial piece of what Americans are really good at. And those two things are how we ultimately prevail. How can, how can, how can ordinary folks help? Well, if you go to our website at www.spiritofamerica.net, there are a listing of projects that people can contribute to. 100% of their funds go directly to whatever we're saying is needed. In the case of So Iraq, you handle your infrastructure, you, you handle your core expenses separately somehow? Yes. Got it. Okay. And our finances are audited, so this is all uh, you know, verified. Totally by, transparent. Uh, totally transparent. We tell people exactly how their money was spent, how much was spent down to the dollar on various items. Sometimes it's just a matter of providing private expertise to the folks on the ground to help them figure out a problem. And money or goods aren't even required. But if you go to our website, it'll list projects. Right now, we're helping uh, children who escaped ISIS in Iraq. Now, it's a great humanitarian thing to do. There are other objectives that were uh, part of the anti-ISIS fight uh, that that will actually help with. We have a project that's uh, going on right now in the Philippines where just last weekend, I think 40 uh, Filipino officers were killed by Islamic extremists. We are, within four days of that, we wired about $8,000 to support the reconstruction of a school that had been damaged in all that fighting. The purpose wasn't only to, to help the school, but was to start to build bonds between the U.S. military, the Filipino military, and the local population. The same thing that General Mattis talked about. How big do you want to get? You said your advantage is quickness, and actually you, you like being small. You like small projects. That's the nature of the work. Do you have some notion that there is a quite well-defined unmet need that you could meet if you doubled somehow, or how, how do you think about that? Yes, well, a year or two ago, uh, when he was the commander of the Special Operations Command, Admiral Bill McRaven uh, asked me, he said, I have teams in 79 countries. How fast can you move? So we've been able to scope out what that's going to require from a field operations standpoint. And the right size, I think, for Spirit of America is an organization that's about 40 people, which turns out, and that's a bottom-up planning process, which turns out to be about the same size as a Marine platoon. Uh, so still very small, and without losing sight of how we operate, which is flexible, fast, responsive, without trying to solve all the problems in an area, but to provide assistance that gets at the heart of a problem to achieve very specific objectives. Spirit of America, all one word, spiritofamerica.net. Yes. Now, 
There are transaction fees you have to pay for processing contribution. What's the smallest unit that's useful to you? Five bucks, 10 bucks, what can you use? Five dollars would be great. And really? Yes. You really could I mean, use we, five we, bucks. we received uh, donations of five dollars. Usually the smallest is around ten dollars, but in the last uh, three weeks, we've had new donations, largely in support of what we're doing in Iraq, from about a thousand new supporters. And we've had 18,000 people support the organization over the years. So we've been very fortunate in the support from the American people. Fantastic. Is there anything better that a, an ordinary American can do to help out? Well, they're, Short they're, of signing up with you, of course, and right. putting on the uniform. Short of that. No, this is, this is a wholly commendable and very effective organization. It is agile and it's responsive and uh, it, is, it, has been, uh, it has truly saved lives. It's been worth its weight in gold to us. General James Mattis, United States Marine Corps, and Jim Hake, CEO and founder of Spirit of America, thank you. Thank you, Peter. For the Hoover Institution and the Wall Street Journal, I'm Peter Robinson. Thank you.